Chapter 16 The white men's ship did not return that spring or in the summer. But every day, whether I was on the headland or gathering shellfish on the rocks or working on my canoe, I watched for it. I also watched for the red ship of the Aleuts. I was not sure what I would do if the Aleuts came. I could hide in the cave which I had stored with food and water, for it was surrounded by thick brush and the mouth of the ravine could only be reached from the sea. The Aleuts had not used the spring and did not know about it because there was another one closer to where they had camped. But they might come upon the cave by chance and then I must be ready to flee. For this reason I worked on the canoe. I had abandoned on the spit. I went to the place where the others were hidden but they were dried out and cracked. Also there were they were too heavy for a girl to push into the water, even a girl as strong as I was. <coughs> the tides had almost buried the canoe and I was bored many days to dig it out of the sand. Since the weather was warm, I did not go back and forth to my house on the headland, but cooked my meals on the sand spit, and at night slept in the canoe, which saved me much time. Even this canoe was too big for me to pull easily in and out of the water, so I set about making it smaller. I did this by loosening all the planks, by cutting the sinews and heating the pitch that bound them together. I then shaped these planks to half their length using sharp knives made from a black stone which is found to be at one place on the island and I bound them together <coughs> with fresh pitch and sinews. The canoe when I had finished was not so beautiful as it had been before but I can now lift one end of it and drag it through the waves. All the time I was working on the canoe which was most of that summer Rontu was with me. He was either sleeping in the shade or of the canoe or running up and down the sand spit chasing the pelicans that roost there in great numbers because there are numerous fish nearby. He never caught any of the birds, yet he would keep trying until his tongue hung out of his mouth. He had learned his name quickly, in many words that meant something to him. Zalwit, for example, which was our word for pelican, and nape, which means fish. I talked to him often using these words and others and many that he did not understand just as though I were talking to one of my people. <coughs> Rontu, I would say after he had stolen a special fish I had speared for my supper. Tell me why it is that you are such a handsome dog and yet such a thief. He would put his head on one side and then the other although I, he knew <coughs> only two of the words and look at me. Or I would say... It's a beautiful day. I have never seen the ocean so calm and the sky looks like blue shell. How long do you think these days will last? <coughs> Rontu would look up at me, just the same, though, and he understood none of the words acting as if he did. Because of this, I was not lonely. I did not know how lonely I'd been until I had Rontu to talk to. When the canoe was finished and the pitch had dried, I wanted to find out how it went through the water and if the planks leaked, so we set off on a long voyage around the island. The voyage took all of one day from dawn until night. There are many sea caves on the island of the Blue Dolphins, and some of them are large and <coughs> go back into the cliffs. One of these was near the headland, where my house stood. The opening was narrow, not much wider than the canoe, but once we were inside it spread out and was larger that, than that of my place on the headland. The walls were black and smooth and slanted far up over my head. The water was almost as black except where light came through the opening. Here was a gold collar and you could see fish swimming around. They were different from the fish on the reefs, having larger eyes and fins that drifted out from their bodies like kelp. And this place opened into another which was smaller and so dark I could see nothing. <coughs> it was very silent in there with no sound of the waves on the shore and only the lapping of the water against the rocky walls. I thought of the god Tumituit, who had become angry at Mukit and gone down, down into another world, and I wondered if it were not to such a place as this that he had gone. Far ahead was a spot of light no larger than my hand, so I, instead of turning back, which I felt like doing, I drifted toward it around many turnings and came into the, another room, much like the first. Along one side was a wide shelf of rock which ran out to the sea through a narrow opening. The tide was full and yet the shelf was out of water. It was a fine place to hide a canoe which could be lifted out and stored there where no one could find it. The ledge joined the cliff just below my house. 
All I needed was a trail down to the cave, and then the canoe would be close at hand. <coughs> I think we've made a discovery, I said to Rontu. Rontu did not hear me. He was watching a devil fish just beyond the opening of the cave. This fish had a small head with eyes that bulged and many arms. All day, Rontu had been barking at the cormorants, the gulls, and the seals, at everything that moved. Now he was quiet watching the black thing in the water. I left the canoe drift along and knelt down out of the sight until I could pick up my spear. The devil fish was in front of us, swimming slowly near the surface, <coughs> moving all of his arms at once. Large devil fish are dangerous if you are in the sea, <coughs> for their arms are as long as a man, and they can quickly wrap them around you. They also have a big mouth and a sharp beak where their arms join their head. This one was the largest that I'd ever seen. Since Ron, too, was standing in front of me, I could just not put the canoe into a better position. I had to lean out to use the spear. And as I did so, the devilfish saw my movement and let loose in the water a black cloud of liquid which instantly hid him from view. <coughs> I knew that the devilfish would not be in the center of this cloud, that he had left it behind. I therefore did not aim my spear at it, but picked up the paddle and waited until he, d he appeared. He was now twice the length of the canoe from me, and though I paddled fast, I could not overtake him. Ron too, I said, for he was watching the black cloud in the water. You have much to learn about the devil fish. Ron too did not look at me or bark. He put his head to one side and the other, still puzzled, more so when the cloud disappeared and nothing was left except clear water. Devilfish is the best food in the seas. The flesh is white and tender and very sweet. But they are difficult to catch without a special kind of spear, which I now decided to make during the winter when I would have much time. I took the canoe to the coral cove not far from the cave and pulled it up on the shore out of reach of the winter storms. There it would be safe until spring, when I would hide it in the cave that Rontu and I had found. It was easy to paddle and did not leak. I was very happy. <coughs> Chapter 17 Storms came early with rain, and between the rains fierce winds struck the island and filled the air with sand. During this time, I made myself another dress, but most of the days I spent fashioning a spear to catch the giant devilfish. I had seen this spear made, as I had seen my father make bows and arrows, yet I knew very little about it, nor no more than I had about the others. Still, I remembered how it looked and how it was used. <coughs> From these memories, I made it after many errors and many hours of work, sitting on the floor while Rontu slept nearby and the storms beat upon the roof. Four of our sea elephant teeth were left, and though I broke all except one, <coughs> this I worked down to a head with a barbed point. I then made a ring and fastened it to the end of the shaft, and into this ring fitted the head, which was tied to a long string made of braided sinew. When the spear was thrown and struck a double fish, the head came loose from the shaft. The shaft floated on the water, but the barbed pointed barb was held by the string, which was tied to your wrist. This spear was especially good because it could be thrown from a distance. <coughs> On the first day of spring, I went down to Coral Cove with my new spear. I knew it was spring because that morning at dawn, the sky was filled with flocks of darting birds. They were small and black and came only at this time of the year. They came out of the south and stayed for two suns, hunting food in the ravines, and then flew off in one direction, flight toward the north. <coughs> Ron, too, did not go with me to the beach because I had let him out of the fence and he had not returned. The wild dogs had been to my house many times that winter and he had paid no heed to them. But the night before, after they had come and gone, he stood at the fence. He stood and whined and walked up and down. It worried me to see him act so strangely and when he refused to eat, I finally let him out. <coughs> now I must push the canoe into the water and drifted toward the reef where the devilfish lived. The water was so clear that it was like the air around me. Far down, the sea ferns moved as though the a breeze were blowing th there, and among them swam the devilfish, trailing their long arms. It was good to be on the sea after the winter storms with the new spear in my hand, but all the morning I, as I hunted the giant devilfish, I kept thinking of Rontu. I should have been happy, yet thinking of him I was not. Would he come back, I wondered? Or had he gone to live with the wild dogs? <coughs> Would he again be my enemy? If he were my enemy, I, I knew that I could never kill him now that he had been my friend. <clears throat> when the sun was high and I hid the canoe in the cave, 
we had found, for once more it was the time that the Aleuts might return, and with the two small bass I had speared, though not the giant devilfish, I went up the cliff. I had planned to make a trail from the cave to my house, but had decided that it could be seen from a ship and by anyone standing on the headland. The climb was steep. As I reached the top, I paused for breath. The morning was quiet except for the noise of the little birds flying from bush to bush and the cries of the gulls who did not like these strangers. And then I heard the sound of dogs fighting. The sound came from far off, perhaps from the ravine, and taking my bow and arrows, I hurried in that direction. I went down the path which led to the spring. There were tracks of the wild dogs around the spring, and among them I saw the large ones of Ron too. The tracks led away through the ravine which winds, winds to the sea. I heard again the distant sound of fighting. <coughs> I went slowly down through the ravine because of my bow and arrows. At last I came to the place where it opens into a meadow right at the edge of the low sea cliff. Sometimes in summers, a, a long time ago, my people had lived there. They gathered shellfish on the rocks and ate them here, leaving the shells which, after many summers, had formed a mound. Over this grass had grown in a thick-leaved plant called napan. On this mound among the grasses and the plants stood Rontu. He stood facing me with his back to the sea cliff. <coughs> in front of him in a half circle were the wild dogs. At first I thought that the pack had driven him there against the cliff and were getting ready to attack him. But I soon, soon saw that two dogs stood out from the rest of the pack between it and Rontu and that their muzzles were wet with blood. One of these dogs was the leader who had taken Rontu's place when he had come to live with me. The other one, which was spotted, I had never seen. The battle was between Rontu and these two dogs. The rest were there to fall upon whichever was beaten. So great was the noise made by the pack, they did not, had not heard me as I came through the brush, nor did they see me now as I stood at the edge of the meadow. They sat on their haunches and barked, with their eyes fixed on the others, but I was sure that Rontu knew I was somewhere near, for he raised his head and smelled the air. The two dogs were trotting back and forth along the foot of the mound, watching Rontu. The fight had probably started in the spring, and they had stalked him to this place where he had chosen to fight. The sea cliff was behind him, and they could not reach him from that direction, so they were trying to think of some other way. It would have been easier if one could have attacked him from the back and one from the front. Rontu did not move from where he stood on top of the mound. Now and again, he lowered his head to lick a wound on his leg, but whenever he did, he always kept his eyes on the two dogs trotting up and down. I could have shot them, for they were within reach of my bow, or driven them off the pack. Yet I stood in the brush and watched. This was a battle between them and Rontu. If I stopped it, they would surely fight again, perhaps at some other place less favorable to him. Rontu again licked his wound, and this time he did not watch the two dogs moving slowly past the mound. I thought it was a lure, and I, so I proved it to be, for suddenly they ran toward him. They came from opposite sides of the mounds, ears laid back, and their teeth were bared. <coughs> Rontu did not wait for the attack but leaping at the nearer one, turned his shoulder, and with his head lowered, caught the dog's foreleg. The pack was quiet, and then in the silence I could hear the sound of the bone breaking, and the dog backed away on three legs. The spotted dog had reached the top of the mound, whirling away from the one he had crippled. Rontu faced him, but not in time to fend off the first heavy rush. Teeth slashed at his throat, and as he turned his body, struck him instead of the flank, and he went down. At that moment, while he lay there on the grass with the dog circling warily in the pack, moving slowly toward him, without knowing that I did so, I fitted an arrow to the bow. A good distance separated Rontu from his attacker, and I could end the battle before he was wounded further, or the pack fell upon him. Yet, as before, I did not send the arrow. <coughs> the spotted dog paused and turned in his tracks and again leaped, this time from behind. Rontu was still lying in the grass with his paws under him. And I thought he did not see that the other one was upon him. But crouching there, he suddenly raised himself and at the same time fastened his teeth to the dog's throat. Together they rolled off the mound, yet Rontu did not let go. The pack sat restless in the grass. In a short time, Rontu rose to his feet and left the spotted dog where it lay. He walked to the top of the mound and lifted his head and gave a long howl. I had never heard this sound before. It was the sound of many things that I did not understand. He trotted past me and up the ravine. When I got to the house, he was there waiting, as if he had not been away or nothing had happened. 
In all the time he lived, Rontu never left again, and the wild dogs, which for some reason divided into two packs, after that never returned to the headland. Chapter 18 Flowers were plentiful that spring because of the winter's heavy rains. The dunes were covered with the mats of sand flowers, which are red and have tiny eyes that are sometimes pink and sometimes white. Yuccas grew tall among the rocks in the ravine. Their heads were clustered with curl curly globes no larger than pebbles in the color of the sun when it rises. Lupines grew where the springs ran. <coughs> and from the sunny cliffs and crevices where no one would think anything could grow, spring the little red and yellow fountains of Cunmall Bush. Birds were plentiful, too. There were many hummers which could stand still in the air and look like bits of polished stone and have long tongues to sip honey with. There were blue jays, which are very quarrelsome birds, and black and white birds that pecked holes in the yucca stalks and the poles of my roof, even in the whale bones of the fence. Ringed red-winged blackbirds also came out flying of the south and flocks of crows and a bird with a yellow body and a scarlet head, which I have never seen before. A pair of these birds made a nest in the stunted tree near my house. It was made from strings of yucca bush and a small opening at the top that hung down like a pouch. The mother laid two speckled eggs, which she and her mate had took turns sitting on. After the eggs hatched, I put shreds of abalone under the tree, and these fed her young. The young birds were not like their mother and father, being grain very ugly. But anyway, I took them from the nest and put them in a small cage that I made of reeds. So later in the spring, when all the birds except the crows left the island and flew off to the north, I had these two for friends. They soon grew beautiful feathers, like those of their parents, and began to make the same sound, which was reap, reap. But it was soft and clear, and much sweeter than the cries of the gulls, <coughs> or the crows, or the talk of the pelicans, which sound like the quarrels, quarreling of toothless old men. Before summer came, the cage was too small for many, my two birds, but instead of building a larger one, I cut the tips of their wings, one wing of each, so that they could not fly away, and let them loose in the house. By the time their wings had grown out, they had learned to take food from my hand. They would jump down from the roof and perch on my arm and leg, making their, their reap reap sound. When their wings began to feather out, I cut them again. This time I let them loose in the yard, where they hopped around, hunting food, perching on Rontu, who by now had gotten used to them. The next time they feathered out, I did not trim their wings, but they never flew further away than the ravine and would always come back at night to sleep, and no matter what, how much they had eaten, to ask for food. One, because he was larger, I called Tainor. I named him after a young man I liked who had been killed by the Aleuts. The other was called Lurai, which was a name I wished I had been called instead of Karana. During the time that was, I was taming the birds, I made another skirt. This one was also made of yucca fibers, softened in water, and braided into twine. I made it just like the others, with folds running lengthwise. It was open on both sides and hung to my knees. The belt I made of seal skin, which could be tied in a knot. I also made a pair of sandals from seal skin for walking over the dunes when the sun was hot, or just to be dressed up when I wore my new yucca skirt of yucca twine. Often I would put on the skirt and the sandals and walk along the cliff of, with Rontu. Sometimes I made a wreath of flowers and fastened it to my hair. After the Aleuts had killed our men at Coral Cove, all the women of our tribe had singed their hair short as a sign of mourning. I had singed mine too, but now that it had grown long and again and came to my waist, I parted it and let it, down, let it fall down my back except when I wore a, a wreath. Then I made braids and fastened them with my long whalebone pins. I also made a wreath for Rontu's neck, which he did not like. Together we would walk along the cliff, looking at the sea. And though the white men's ship did not return that spring, it was a happy time. The air smelled of flowers, and birds sang everywhere. <laughs>